In the UK, there are less than a thousand murders committed per year, which is a tiny amount compared to other crimes. And yet murder takes huge precedence in the news media, as well as in popular culture. This is possibly because murder is one of the most, if not the most, serious crime that there is. And yet, even though the law is relatively settled in this area, as we'll see throughout this lecture, it is still prime for reform, as we'll go on to talk about later on. So with all this in mind, let's get started with a definition of what murder actually is. The definition of murder is actually really old and comes from Sir Edward Coke in the Institutes of the Laws of England that was first published in 1628. And yet this still forms the basis of the definition for murder that we use today. And even though it's quite lengthy, we will split it up and go through it in bit by bit detail. But we can already see standing out for us the actus reus and also the mens rea of murder and these are what we'll sort of be focusing our discussion around as we go forward. But let's start at the top. And the first sort of bit of this quote is a um, man of sound memory and of the age of discretion. And sound memory doesn't mean that someone's good at remembering things. It's more that the person is of sound mind. In other words, they're not insane. So we can look at the McNaughton rules from 1843 for that. And also that they don't suffer from diminished responsibility which would make them guilty of manslaughter instead, as defined by Section 2 of the Homicide Act 1957. And that's something that we'll cover in a future lecture on manslaughter. Finally, the age of discretion is a reference to the age of criminal responsibility. And currently in England and Wales, that's 10 years old. Unlawfully killeth then is the main focus of the Actus Reus. And this idea of an unlawful killing is slightly unusual. But the way to think about it is, is there a lawful justification for the act that someone has carried out? So, for example, if someone kills another person in self-defence, then there is a lawful justification for that action. Similarly, in Attorney General's reference number three of 1994, the hypothetical um, situation was discussed, whereby a doctor gives a woman an abortion but doesn't carry it out properly. So the child is later born and then dies, unfortunately, after childbirth. And the question is, well, would the doctor be guilty of murder in that type of situation? But the, there would be lawful justification for the doctor carrying out the abortion in the first place under the Abortion Act 1967. And so he wouldn't have the actus reus in that particular situation. The next um, thing from our definition from Coke is within any county of the realm, but this has been much um, more expanded nowadays and can extend to anywhere in the world as long as the killer is of British nationality. They can still be tried for murder in England and Wales. And that comes from Section 9 of the Offences Against the Person Act 1861, as well as Section 3 of the British Nationality Act 1948. And it actually even goes further than this in some circumstances, um, where the killer's nationality might not even be relevant. And that comes under Section 4 of the Suppression of Terrorism Act 1978. So a much expanded definition for that. A reasonable creature in rerum natura must be the victim of any particular murder. And in rerum natura is a Latin phrase simply meaning in the nature of thing things, or in other words, someone who is in existence. And so the question is, well, who counts as being in existence? Most of the time that's relatively obvious, but it can be a bit controversial around the start of life. A fetus is not considered to be a person or a reasonable creature in rerum natura. And this therefore comes under different offences. If it is a not viable fetus, then it can be an offence under Section 58 of the Offences Against the Person Act 1861. Meanwhile, if it is a viable uh, fetus, it is an offence under the Infant Life Preservation Act 1929. So we're not going to be talking about murder in relation to fetuses. But when does life start from the view of criminal law? Where, when can a baby actually be murdered? And the idea is having independent existence from the mother. So Poulton, the case from 1832, talks about the baby being completely expelled from the mother. 
Um, but it's not necessary, according to Reeves, that the umbilical cord must have been cut. Now, obviously, these two cases of Poulton and Reeves are relatively old, and so it's very likely that modern medical definitions of when a um, child has independent existence of the mother would come into play uh, if this was part of a murder trial in the 21st century. And similarly, we'd be reliant on medical expertise for the end of life as well. This is often defined as sort of the end of brainstem activity. Um, but it's useful to have a medical opinion on those things to help inform a jury for a murder trial. The question of whether a fetus can be sort of murdered has also come up in human rights law, particularly in the case of Vaux and France 2004, um, and this came under Article 2, which is the right to life. But the Court of Human Rights actually applied um, sort of discretion to member state countries. And they basically said, well, it's up to member states whether they want to decide if a fetus can be murdered or not. So the law in England and Wales can be different to the law in Ireland, for example. And that's completely fine as far as human rights law is concerned. The next part of the definition is that it has to be under the king's peace. But this is given a very broad definition as well and can include enemies um, during a time of war, but not in the heat of war itself. So if you're in the middle of a battle or something, then that won't count as murder. Um, but as per the case of Page in 1954, a British soldier can still be convicted of murder if it's not in the heat of war. So in that particular example, it was in Egypt and the soldier killed someone in a village um, who was completely defenceless and they were convicted of murder. And this is particularly relevant sort of recently uh, in relation to Abu Ghraib and the war in Iraq where British soldiers did actually commit atrocities against Iraqi citizens who were under their custody. And that obviously wasn't in the heat of war and so they could still be liable because it was under the Queen's peace. The mens rea of murder is malice aforethought, um, but that definition is not really given its ordinary meaning. Um, malice would suggest that something like a mercy killing would not be found under murder, whereas it actually is. And so instead what we have is a slightly varied definition. We still use the phrase malice aforethought, but the actual definition that's applied comes from the case of Maloney in 1985. And there's two alternative mens reas for murder. Firstly, an intention to kill, and secondly, an intention to cause grievous bodily harm. Intention is defined on the basis of Woolin in 1985. Um, some of you may be familiar with that case. It talks about things being a virtual certainty. And meanwhile, grievous, as in grievous bodily harm, is taken to mean serious. And it's given an ordinary meaning that can be applied by the jury. The hope it being that grievous would hopefully be relatively obvious given the circumstances of a particular case. Meanwhile, the test for liability in terms of malice of forethought is a subjective test. This was after an objective test was suggested in Smith and DPP. It's not ever really been formally overruled. But the um, subjective test that came from the Privy Council in Franklin and Moore against the Crown in 1987 is taken to be the sort of formative test for liability in murder. Um, finally, un re in reference to malice of forethought and the mens rea for murder, we have the abolition of constructive malice by Section 1 of the Homicide Act 1957. And this was basically the law before 1957, whereby if you went into somewhere to commit a bank robbery and someone died during the process, you were automatically assumed to have the mens rea for murder. But that wasn't necessarily fair. And so the intention to commit another felony no lo is no longer sufficient mens rea for murder if a death did result as, as part of those actions or as part of that felony. Similarly, um, correcting another old rule, um, Section 1 also says that it's no longer murder to kill while preventing lawful arrest or by helping someone to escape custody, etc.
So the party wounded or hurt, etc., actually dies. So we all eventually die, unfortunately, but murder is seen to be the acceleration of death. And this can prove to be particularly controversial around the end of life and palliative care. So in certain circumstances, a doctor may issue someone palliative care that may shorten their life, but will ease their pain. And so the question is, in those circumstances, the doctor is in fact accelerating death, even if they're doing it for a good reason. So should they be prosecuted for murder in those circumstances? And generally speaking, the courts take a rather broad approach and will say that if the doctors are acting in the patient's best interest, then they will not be prosecuted for murder. This particularly came up in the Airedale NHS Trust and Bland case in 1993. And we can also refer to statute law such as Section 4 of the Mental Capacity Act 2005, which also talks about ideas of the patient's best interest and when um, end-of-life care should be removed when someone is in, say, for example, a vegetative state. So the idea of the um, person having to die within a year and a day has been scrapped now since the Law Reform Year and a Day Rule Act 1996. And there's now no time limit. And if you think about it, this makes sense, because in the 17th century, the medical care wasn't there to keep someone alive for more than a year and a day if they had been attacked by someone. However, in the 21st century, we can obviously keep people alive for years even if they had a very serious incident. And so it might be several years down the line before someone actually dies as, as a result of their injuries. So even though there's now no time limit, Attorney General Commission is required for prosecution after three years, or if the defendant has already be, been convicted of an offence in circumstances connected to the murder. So the defendant during that time may have already been convicted of, say, um, grievous bodily harm, or assault, um, but the person can still be um, convicted of murder, and that doesn't contradict double jeopardy rules. So finally, as we wrap up this lecture on murder, let's have a think about sentencing. And the way that sentencing for murder works is that a minimum term is set, and then the courts can expand on that minimum term depending on the circumstances of the case. Now, previously, the minimum term was set by the Home Secretary, but because the Home Secretary is a political figure and not a judge, this was seen to be incompatible with Article 5 and Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights in the case of the Crown and Home Secretary, ex parte Anderson, in 2002. So instead, what happens now is that the minimum term is set by a judge under Schedule 21 of the Criminal Justice Act 2003. And they can set the different variations of the minimum term, the first being a whole life minimum term, which is for very serious murder offences. So this might be multiple murders, serious sexual murders, um, also child murders, things like that. The next step down the ladder is a 30 years minimum term. This might be for murders of police officers, um, murders that involve firearms and also racially aggravated murders as well. Finally, um, 15 years as a minimum term covers other murders. Finally, one of the important things that often comes up in relation to murder is how the law should actually be reformed. As I said at the start, this is an area of the law where the definition is really old, and even though it has developed somewhat over time, we are still quite reliant on this definition given by Coke in the 17th century. There was a Law Commission report which was the last major one in 2006, and this talked about replacing murder and manslaughter with one single offence of unlawful killing. And that's raised certain questions. It's an interesting idea um, whether that would actually work in terms of um, creating a distinction between murder and manslaughter would be quite interesting to see. It's probably worth reading that report in full if you are going to answer an essay question on this area. Secondly, there's the idea of a victim-based system. In other words, you should um, convict someone more if the victim is, say, for example, a child or a police officer. We've seen to some extent that this is already true in terms of setting a minimum term for the sentence. But in terms of actually defining the crime by this, I don't think it would particularly work. 
um, because it almost gets to a point where you're placing more value on certain lives compared to others. Finally, there is, has also been talk about using the American system of like first degree murder and second degree murder. And again, this sort of is a, it comes back to sort of these suggestions that come from the Law Commission report in 2006 about how we want to actually split up the idea of murder itself um, and how we want to actually do that. Overall, though, the law of murder in this country does work generally quite well. And we do have to think carefully before making any significant changes to the law as it currently stands. If you're answering a question about murder in a problem question, remember to go through the actus reus and the mens rea and cover all of the different elements of Koch's original definition from 1628 that we talked about. Murder is also likely to come up as an essay question in a coursework or an exam. And so you're going to be wanting to think about some of those edge cases where there are grey areas in the law. In particular, thinking about the start of life and who can actually be murdered, as well as the end of life and the types of palliative care that might be available. There are also other controversial issues, such as the age of criminal responsibility that can link to murder as well. And also think about those reforms that we have discussed and try and research some of your own. This often comes up in the news and was discussed last year uh, amongst MPs, so make sure you do look that up. If you did enjoy this particular lecture, remember to leave it a like. You can also subscribe for more lectures in the future. I hope to cover manslaughter rather soon as well. Um, also, um, make sure that you leave a comment below if you do have any questions. I'm always happy to respond to those, um, so do do that. Thanks again for watching. Bye.